Why don't we get started? I'd like to welcome everybody to the Lake Forest Graduate School Leadership Learning Webinar Series. This series provides monthly learning on relevant business topics, like today's topic, Big Data. This program, as I mentioned, is hosted by Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. I am Carol Modlin with Lake Forest Graduate School of Management, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, Lake Forest is an independent accredited institution with over 50 years experience providing practical business leader education. This education comes in the form of an MBA degree, certificate programs, and targeted training and development through our Corporate Learning Solutions program. Corporate Learning Solutions specializes in developing corporate managers and leaders by combining relevant content with expertise of our business leader faculty to provide customized training, consultation, coaching, and organizational development services to our corporate clients. We're grateful for the sponsorship and generosity of our clients and longtime supporter of the school, Trustmark, and the Trustmark Foundation. Trustmark provides access to a full spectrum of flexible benefit solutions, including health plan administration for self-funded employer groups, payroll deducted voluntary products, group medical benefits, and health and fitness management programs. We are able to bring this webinar to you on a complimentary basis as a result of Trustmark's support. So before we move into today's, pro into today's program, I'd like to take a moment to go over how we will interact today. So during the program, you will be invited to use some of the annotation tools, which can be found over here in this corner of your screen. Um, you may be asked to use some emoticons, which are these buttons here, right underneath the participant panel. There will also be a poll that you'll be asked to participate in. That will pop up on your screen and should be easy for you to figure out how to do. If you have questions or comments during the program, please submit those through the chat feature, which is down here. You may need to open up the panel. And when you submit a chat, please make sure you check the drop down and uh, set it to all attendees or all, all participants before submitting. We will address comments and questions at the end of the program, so please submit them as you think of them. Uh, please be sure that you are muted and that your video is off for the entire program. That will help us avoid any unnecessary distractions during the program. So let's get ready to go. So please close your other applications so that you're ready to start, and then once your applications are closed, Please raise your hand using the little hand by the emoticons to indicate that you can hear me well and that you're ready to go. Okay, I see a couple hands. Um, okay, so if you can hear me and everything's fine, just go ahead and raise your hand. Great, it looks like we are good to go. So we can move into the new program, into the main program. So I'd like to introduce you today to Steve Rudnick. Steve is lead faculty for the Management Analytics Curriculum Development at Lake Forest Graduate School. He teaches operations management and business analytics and research in the MBA program. Steve's day job is National and Canadian Legal Bill Review Manager at Zurich Financial Services. And in that role has developed and implemented operational excellence for a multinational legal invoice audit department. He also created, defined metrics, and a balanced scorecard approach to assure the unit's success. So without further ado, I bring you Steve. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much um, for the introduction and the chance to uh, discuss this great topic with everybody uh, who's, on the, who's on the phone today. Um, first of all, everybody can hear me, I take it. Are we all good out there? Great. So now moving on, slide number one, because I don't want to look at my face again. Um, big data. So great, great um, topic for, uh, for discussion nowadays. Um, big data has become a very, very interesting topic since probably the late 90s, early 2000s. And what I'd like to go over today with big data is really the scope of what big data is the basics of what are some of the challenges with big data, and there are many challenges associated with big data, so we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, what is it really? Is it changing? Is it here to stay? Um, really all of the discussion around that. 
then, the, then basically the discussion will be broken into three parts. The second part then that we're going to talk about is a balanced scorecard approach to organization and what that really means and what it doesn't mean because I know that organizations have implemented balanced scorecards in a number of different ways. So we're going to get to the theoretical truth about what a balanced scorecard is and what it's supposed to do for you. And then the last thing that we want to talk about is big data is great. Information is, is interesting. Um, creating information from data is interesting. But if that data doesn't stick on the end user, meaning if that information isn't isn't shareable and isn't interesting, what we find is that our constituents don't remember that information. So the third part of the presentation we're going to talk about is basically how do we visually understand or graphically represent and or visually, graphically, and or pictorially uh, explain this information. So three basic, three basic sections, big data, balanced scorecard approach, and last but not least, the, uh, the data visualization. So moving on. We, we talked about the agenda. Um, we talked about the value of data, data mining techniques, and when we talk about big data, balanced scorecard approaches, and last but not least, infographics, or that visualization of the data. So thoughts on big data. Um, let's talk about the um, thoughts on big data. This is going to be a little poll, and what we're going to ask you to do is give your opinion of basically what is big data? Is it A, a packing trend, B, no one really knows what it is, C, it sounds interesting, D, I know a lot about big data, or E, I don't really care. Hopefully, if you're on the phone, you do care a little bit about big data, but I'd like to know what, what people's thoughts on big data is or are. And the results are coming in. This is great. So it sounds interesting. That's great. Um, that's really the, the, the uh, theme coming out as number one with 42%, 43%, followed by B, no one really knows what it is. Well, that's interesting because we do know what it is. And, um, but what's fun about this is that uh, we've got about 18 seconds left to answer, so I think you want to answer. But what is interesting is that uh, you're all interested in what it is, and um, there's only a few of you out there who know a lot about big data. So that's great to know. Um, and no one really knows what it is. Well, the funny thing is a lot of people know what it is, and results are in, and it sounds interesting is really the top answer. So we're going to move on and we're going to talk about uh, big data. So let, let's really talk about what big data is. We know what it is. It's data, and if you think about it this way, every transaction, every operational transaction that is accomplished in the world is generally a uh, bit of data now. And that data is all tracked. Um, and we'll talk about tracking, tracking methods and things of that nature. But what's really interesting is all of your financial, your credit card, your debit card transactions, your cell phone, uh, where your car is, GPS, all that is data, and all that data is tracked. So why I say what is big data is an ongoing moving target. Well, what was big data in 2000 is now big, bigger data in 2015 and will be bigger data in 2020 and will even be larger data in 2030. So what, what is big data? It's really a broad term defining large data sets. Um, and these are very, very large data sets. And these data sets require unique data processing methodologies. So many of the things that we do in Excel and many of the things that we do with our own operational data, our small group operational data, cannot be accomplished with these large data sets. So we need special um, technology and special tools in order to call through all that data and mine that data. Interesting fact is since the uh, 1980s, information storage doubled approximately every four years. That is becoming, um, that is becoming ever, ever more interesting in the fact that um, it is exponential because of the data that we're collecting. 
So this becomes larger and larger and larger every four years. Um, in, in generally, in excess of 2.5 exabytes of data are created daily. That's 2.5 times 10 to the 18th power of data are created daily. So very, very interesting. So when you talk about big data, it's out there. The question is how do you access it and start to use it to make better business decisions. Okay. So how do we talk about big data? We talk about the fact that we're cap capturing all these transactions on a daily basis. So how is it captured? It is captured through, as we talked about a little bit, information sensing mobile devices, that's your phone, um, aerial remote, uh, software logs, cameras, microphones, RFID, radio frequency ID, uh, readers, etc. So again, almost any transaction that you have uh, is being captured in some source of data. Um, and the sources and uses of the data are very abundant. Example is a financial transaction. So all your financial tra transactions go into creating your FICO scores. Uh, your internet searches, uh, that comes up with your eBay product recommendations. And then last but not least, our wonderful United States National Security Agency uh, tracks all of our internet information. And that, is, that internet information is, um, is all stored in a facility, they're creating a large facility in uh, Salt Lake City. And the reason that's important is because uh, we're, we're a society that's well protected by our government and that United States National Security Agency protects, protects us as citizens from, you know, potential terrorist activity. So all of that data is, is, is stored and as, as I said, they're building a, a tremendous facility in Salt Lake City someplace. So, um, so that's uh, the, the bottom line on that. Um, next slide. Okay. So what are the challenges? Give me one minute here to see if my microphone is okay. Okay, so challenges with big data. Well, first of all, there's the analysis. So analysis of big data is a huge challenge, as we said, because of the way that we're collecting the data and the types of data we have, we've had to create, we've had to create new um, analytical tools in order to, to uh, understand that data and create information from that data. The second thing is data capture. How do we capture that data and, you know, what is, you know, we're going to go down to the bottom and talk about privacy. When we capture that data, are there privacy concerns? Obviously, all of your healthcare data is captured, tracked, and we all know that there's all kinds of rules regarding medical information and the privacy of medical information. So who has access to that data and what can you do with it? So there's privacy concerns. Curation is another huge, um, a huge problem with big data. When we have that much data out there, how do we, tra how do we store it? What is the correct um, methodology for storing it? And what do we do with it in five years? Do we, do we store it? Do we delete it? So there's all kinds of questions around the curation of the data itself. Another big issue or challenge is associated with big data is sharing. Well, we used to carry around thumb drives and share data on thumb drives. Obviously, with data of this size, we get into sharing issues. Do we send it to the cloud? Well, then we may have privacy issues. So there's all kinds of issues associated with sharing of those large, large data sets. So as much as we talk about big data and the power of big data, unless you can get through some of these challenges, it makes it very, very difficult to analyze and create information from that data. Transfer is similar to the sharing and the storage. And then last but not least is visualization. Data is only as good as the information you can create from that data. And what I call the stickiness of that information, meaning somebody's ability to remember it and say, hey, that's an important point that was brought up. So how do we visualize this data? Very, very important.
So the new frontier, so what's interesting about big data is that there's all kinds of new analytical tools that were created in order to handle all this big data. The first one we're going to talk about is A-B testing. A-B testing is also known, some of you may have known as split testing. And what that allows us to do, and, and it's very, very powerful because we track all the uh, transactions, it allows us to compare two scenarios for optimization. So what we can do is we can create a web page, a web page A and a web page B, and we can launch those web pages, and we can basically look at sales through those websites and see which one works better, A or B. That makes for very, very, very powerful operational decisions. The second new tool that was coined in 2005 is something known as crowdsourcing. And what's interesting is crowdsourcing is very, very popular now and it can replace some of the um, experts that you may have in your organizations. What crowdsourcing does is it basically allows for internet and or um, online participation of experts to answer um, questions that you may have. So, or it could help you create products. So instead of using your expert in-house, you could potentially throw a product out there to, um, you know, you could, you could blog about products or blog about ideas or blog about scenarios that aren't working for you in the workplace. And lo and behold, you'll have experts that will come in and experts will give you their thoughts on that. So, so what ends up happening is, um, is you get the best of both worlds. You basically, you harness the power of experts through the internet, which can lead to better and better products. So we have a question from Jonathan A. One of the biggest challenges I experience with big data dealing with different enterprises is the qualification of value data. For most enterprises, it's about the ROI, just by two cents. I completely agree with you. Um, and I think that the key is whenever we're doing the analysis using these tools, it really is all about the ROI or the return on your investment and how much, how much you're going to pay for the data and the analysis in order to get the right uh, return on investment. That's a great point. Uh, data fusion is another interesting concept. Data fusion um, is basically when we take uh, data and we fuse it with knowledge and basically it's kind of a uh, tool that we use uh, in sensory networks and robotics, but what that does is it, it, it creates your, um, it creates your drive bolt car or things of that nature. Next new tool that we we'll talked about is evolutionary algorithms. Evolutionary algorithms are actually, uh, algorithms are nothing more than just um, models that, that use data to create models to, to do predictions. Where evolutionary comes into place is they will use other data elements and knowledge over time to actually change the algorithm to get more and more precise over time. So very, very interesting new frontier in, in data analytics. Uh, pattern recognition, so machine learning, again using robotics. Um, this really combines uh, computer integration with data analytics to understand recognized patterns to help you uh, improve your operations. Natural language processing, for those of you who have the, uh, the navigation systems in your car, natural language processing is what we use all the time now uh, in data analytics to understand what people are saying. Very, very popular with the National Security Agency, with, with phone calls and things of that nature. And last but not least, and this one's been around for a little bit, a little bit of time, is the uh, time series analysis. And again, this is really just looking at predictive modeling using uh, time series. Any questions right now? I'll take a, a pause because I'm talking too much. So any questions that you may have out there right now? You can just uh, send, if you have a question, just send it through the chat if you would. Okay, it doesn't look like any questions at this point. So what I will do is move on to the next slide. So again, what we're talking about is data mining. So some of the challenges associated with data mining, we go back to our, um, to our old 
statistical textbooks, we talked about was basically taking that data and creating informa information. And the challenges that we have with creating that information are, first of all, we have to mine the data, and then we have to decide whether or not that data is parametric. And parametric, for those of you who remember your statistics, is your, um, we do have a question out there, thanks. Are we going to identify any specific software programs we should, we should learn? Um, there's many out there um, when we talk about big data, and I, I hope folks don't mind if I just answer the questions as they come up so I don't lose them. Um, but specific software programs for big data, the, the issue with very, very large data sets is the mining. And the mining of that big data really takes solutions, and I know we talk about stats, uh, which is a statistical package. Um, those are the types of organizations that can really look into um, large data sets and be able to mine those and help you mine those. The other group that, that we know is IBM. IBM looks at very, very large data sets and helps us create information from those data sets. But if your data set is smaller, any of your normal statistical packages, SPSS, SAS, um, I am not, Hadoop is a package, I am not familiar with Hadoop, unfortunately. Um, but any, any of the other uh, programming packages, uh, statistical packages, SAS, SPSS, um, and Jonathan, thank you, R is very popular and free, thank you. Um, but then, when, as we talk about data mining, we talk about those packages, you have to be able to analyze the data and decide from inferential statistics whether or not the data set is parametric. So the parametric data set is nothing more than a normal bell-shaped curve. So if your data set comes out as a parametric or bell-shaped, you can use certain statistical elements on that. If your data is non-parametric, that means that it's a skewed data set, then you have to look at the data much differently and decide what methodologies you're going to use on a non-parametric data set. And last but not least, then you could have semi-parametric, which means it's almost parametric, but it's not quite, or maybe different groups of uh, normal distributions. The next thing we're going to talk about a little bit is predictive modeling. So once you decide what statistics and what um, variables you want to look at, you can get into predictive modeling. Predictive modeling, also known as creating algorithms, is nothing more than, than trying to um, trying to create multiple variables, multiple models that help you predict based on, and I have a question for Paul, sorry for stopping, I'll come back. Paul, can Microsoft Excel be used to mine big data? Um, well, I think Microsoft Excel cuts off at about 32,000 uh, lines or, or columns. So what I found is even with the use of my Zurich data, Microsoft Excel can't always be used because I will run out of room with the data set. So be careful with Microsoft Excel. Um, it depends on how big the uh, spreadsheet is. I will finish, thank you, and I will finish my thought before taking the next question. Um, when we talk about predictive modeling, what we're talking about is using variables, multiple variables, to create a model or an algorithm where you have predictions. So you're making predictions based on the variables. Um, there is something called design and experimentation, or DOE. And design and experimentations basically allow you to model in multi-dimensional space um, up to 24 to 30 variables. And those design experiments actually allow you to save a lot of time and do some very nice validation studies on your data. So if you're looking at doing multiple, multiple variables, being a lot of variables, 24, 30 variables, design of experiments is your way to go. And you can look at books, and there's all kinds of different statistical packages for design of experiments. There's also analysis of variance, a way of looking at the, um, the spread and, and, and the, the amount of spread in your data. And then last but not least, there's also your simple regression, which we all know and use often. And regression is good for, you know, kind of a forecasting tool. Um, some people use it for forecasting. But regression is basically just looking at a couple of different variables and understanding the model based on a few variables. So that's, that's what I wanted to touch on from a predictive modeling perspective. 
Um, from Kathy, can SAP business objects be used to mine big data of a vertical database? Yes, it can. Um, business objects is much uh, a much larger platform than um, than uh, Excel, and really business objects. The question that we would have with business objects is: Have we set up? Have we set up the um, have we set up the variables correctly in business objects in order to do that mining? So yes, business objects can be used to mine big data. The, the, the challenges you have with business objects in and of itself is it's not a very, very strong statistical package. So a lot of the inferential statistics, predictive modeling, some of the higher level statistical things cannot be done within the uh, business objects platform. Any other questions? Those are very good questions, folks. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about um, big data analysis. So how does it place your organization in front? What I'm going to open it up to now is how many people in, in, the, in the group here have used data in order to make better decisions based on operations, customer insights, retail, finance, real estate. Please go ahead and just type in your answers where you used, where you used data and or big data to make some of these better changes and we can discuss them a little bit. Whether it's IT related, research and science, real estate, Great, we've got research, telecom, oil, gas, and energy, nice, financial gas, perfect, customer insights, all great answers. Wow, well done. Everybody's used it. Very nice. So a couple of the ones that I want to talk about, I find it very, very um, sales forecasting retail. You guys are perfect. Very nicely done. So the first one I'm talking about is operational, operational type uh, efficiencies or operational big data used in operationals. So operational basically what I can do, there's a number of different ways, is I can take historical data and I can look for patterns, efficiencies, uh, think about operational efficiencies, um, I can prevent fraud, we use, uh, we use it to look for fraud patterns, we use it to reduce costs. We can uh, understand and assess our suppliers, and last but not least, we can proactively scale operations, which is really important nowadays to uh, understand uh, growth and proactively scale your operations. From a customer uh, perspective, uh, we use it, Zerk currently uses it for customer insights, uh, tremendously uh, net promoter scoring, and we can look at transactional uh, behavior and look to see where our customers uh, what actual transactional um, tasks really drive net promoter scoring from our customers. So we can look at banking retail media, we can look at purchasing patterns from our customer insights, which parlays into retail. Retail, uh, again, we track, we track um, buying, buying behavior, and then we can look at product preferences. So we can look to see, based on historical data, Based on uh, seasonality, we can look to see how we want to uh, how we want to stock our products. Uh, finance, very important finance. Finance right now is um, becoming very very data centric, and what you're seeing finance, and when I talk about finance, like financial organizations, we're moving from basically profit centric to customer centric models, and that is because we're allowed to use all the data we have to understand profitability and really focus then on the customers that we really want to work with. Real estate, uh, obviously uh, streamlining financial processes by, by credit scores, um, understanding prospective buyers, and last but not least, uh, you can get to smarter building management. Um, we talked about real estate sales. Everybody knows of Trulia and Zillow out there. They can price your house automatically. Um, a lot of, lot of uh, ways that uh, they can take it to building uh, the real estate push. 
And then research and science, obviously we've been using data and research and science for numerous years, but for those of you who want to MSM today, Tom great little article that there will be a, a magnitude 5.0 earthquake or greater in 20 miles southeast of LA by 2018. So that's, and that was all driven by um, NASA, NASA and uh, they use radar and GPS data to understand that there is a 99% chance of an earthquake south of LA occurring by 2018. And again, that's the measure uh, based on measurable strain in the LA basin. So interesting ways that you, the world is using data really make, you know, make, make our lives more, more uh, enjoyable. And by the way, 5.0 uh, earthquake is not tremendous, but if it gets up to 6, that could be pretty large. But understanding that those, those kind of things help financial organizations like Europe understand how to price their, you know, price the market appropriately in LA if we have property. And last but not least, we know all the different ways that uh, big data is helping, helping IT and IT helping move big data forward. Any questions at this point before I move on? Okay. So, another question for you, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and uh, send your chat to how many of you is, how many of you have used balance scorecards and what have you used them for? Because now we're moving from data to using that data in a methodology that helps you become more productive in the workplace and or understand your workplace better. So how many people have used balance scorecards in the workplace? What have you used them for? At a monthly, I have a yes. Anybody else haven't used? Okay. Great. So a lot of people have used balance scorecards. Interesting, it's frequent. So great. Thanks for being interactive, folks. We got a lot of good good responses. A lot of people yes, no experience with it. Okay, well the key one of the things that we that we you know we talk about evolution of business and we talk about evolution of data and Moving forward, thanks for the, the responses. We now start talking about visualizing this data and the evolution of data and the evolution of organizations. And you know, back back in the past, and finance still runs. We talked about an ROI. And finance still runs organizations, but before finance used to be very, very specific, and everything was was measured around. Um, Financials and how the organization was doing financially, and and that was really what drove the business. What balance scorecard attempted to do, and truly balanced now, not just a financial scorecard, but what it tries to do is it tries to look at everything that all the measures that drive the performance of your organization, and basically there's four different avenues of that. There's the financial perspective. There's the internal process perspective, so how good am I handling my processes? Am I efficient operationally? There's a learning and growth perspective, so how are my people doing? Are we educating our workforce so that they're learning and growing and being happy and productive? And last but not least, there's the customer perspective. And all of those should be, you know, all of those should support the vision and the strategy of the organization. And as my CEO says in my organization, you can have the best vision and the best strategy, but unless you can execute and execute flawlessly, vision and strategy are worthless. Execution trumps strategy every day. So the question becomes, how do we create metrics and scorecards that support that vision and strategy and let us know how we're doing from an execution perspective? And that's what the balance scorecard is meant to do. It looks at a long-term strategy versus your short-term actions. You can measure the short-term actions in your balance scorecard, but they, that balance scorecard must support the long-term strategy for balanced performance. And what that, what that does is it creates new strategic systems. So what you can create now is HR systems, um, management systems, 
that look at your operations, look at your financials, look at your education and learning, and look at your customer perspective. So that is the goal of truly balanced scorecards. They support the true organizational strategy. Now you say, well, how can I, how can I implement a balanced scorecard in my unit? Well, if you look at the financial aspects of your unit, you look at the your internal processes, your operations, you look at your, in, you know, some of you may use things like unit costs to understand your 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 processes and your efficiency. You can learn at you can use the your, your uh, development plans for learning and growth. And then obviously, if you have a customer base, you should be doing your surveys, your net promoter scoring, and your customer perspective. So you have all those things that are in your balanced scorecard, and you can then manage over time or over the years to see how you're doing in supporting your long-term strategy of developing your people, getting better customer perspective, better customer insight, better customer scoring, improving your financials, and obviously becoming more efficient which improves your bottom line. So here's, here's an example of a balanced scorecard. And this is, you know, this is, this is just basically kind of an operational or task-based uh, balanced scorecard. And this is the, uh, you know, the sales rep for um, in the green for customer contact. So you can see that by week, you can look at how well these individuals are doing in terms of their uh, sales. And this is just one small piece of a balanced scorecard. Obviously, this doesn't show the operational metrics, but this is one piece of a way of scorecarding. There's no right or wrong answer in scorecarding. The key is that when you look at this, you say, okay, red is bad, so certain, certain people are not doing well. They're in the red. Yellow is obviously borderline. Green is good. It allows people to understand information in the same way, who's doing well, who's not doing well. You'll hear these balanced scorecards, people call them dashboards. There's all kinds of different things that you hear within organizations as to how they, sh they show metrics. With that, I'll open it up for questions on balanced scorecards. Does anybody have any questions on balanced scorecards? on balanced scorecarding. For those of you who, um, and, and I mean this in a, in a serious perspective from when I, when I took over a unit within my organization, we had very few metrics and we created a truly balanced approach and, and the staff, you know, people look at balanced scorecards and say, oh, well, it's your way of, of grading me, it's your way of watching what I'm doing to make sure that I'm working hard. Um, that was the first impression that people got. But then when we used them over the years, people were actually very thankful because they knew they were on a daily basis. They knew when they were falling behind, they knew where they needed to be, and, and, and there was complete transparency from management and the staff as to where they were and where they are and how they're doing. And you may find that some of your employees may not enjoy the job they're in, and then you look around the organization for something that's more in line with what they want, but the key to balance scorecards is the transparency in which you're doing business so that you know exactly what's driving the business. So a very, very powerful tool for your staff to know how things are, how things are going. Okay, moving on. How many people believe a picture is worth a thousand words? Let's just see some yeses or noes out there. Yep, great point. Thank you, folks. I'm going to go back up to one question. Where is the data being pulled from? Example, how do we know that Jason contacted 14 or 15 customers? Well, that's a real good question. It depends on how you are measuring your, um, measuring your organization. So, in, and I can give a couple examples. I'm currently, I have a double role. I have a call center that I also manage within the towers, and we have call logs. So I can pull data from the call center from the call logs, 
And on a daily basis, I can show people how many calls they've taken, how long their call time is, et cetera, et cetera. So along those lines, I can show people their productivity because that comes out of my phone system. Um, on the other hand, with my legal background, with my legal experience at, uh, at my organization, we look at how many invoices people process on a daily basis. So we can pull data on invoices processed so people can know on a daily, weekly, monthly basis how well they're doing in terms of processing and auditing of invoices. So there's, it, it depends on where, you're, where your productivity data is domiciled, but once you know where your productivity data is domiciled, then you can pull directly from that data warehouse and create these scorecards. Does that answer your question? That was July. And in, in the case of, of Jason, Jason may, um, yes, got it, thank you. Jason may uh, have to have to log his calls, for example. If he makes 14 um, cold calls, maybe he has to log those into a system that, that can then be um, that can then be uh, queried for that information. Okay, back to a picture is worth a thousand words. Everybody believes that a picture is worth a thousand words. I love Stacy, depends on how wordy you are. Okay, so um, but here's you know here's the next so we're, we're, talk, we're talking about evolution, right? We're talking about thinking forward about what the world wants and where the world is going so that we can become better, better at our business, better at understanding um, how to meet our customers' needs. And the one thing that I, you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting long in the tooth, and when I first started doing you know, my job, we would write white papers on things and we and then we went to PowerPoints. And now what I'm finding is PowerPoints aren't even good enough within your organization because PowerPoints could be twenty, you know, twenty twenty pages long. So what we've done is the world is going to moving toward give me one picture, give me one um, graphic representation of what that data suggests. I like your breath, I like it. It depends on what type of learner you are, visual, experiential, I completely agree with you. But in the meantime, if I don't have the opportunity to get up in front of my board of directors in Zurich, Switzerland, how do I convey that information to them in, in, a, in a way that everybody would look at it the same? The thought and the next wave of tools for visualization of data is something called infographics. And infographics is a tool that allows you to show a picture and or diagrams to um, get your point across. So, how do you present it? Well, infographics is a new wave, a new wave of influential data presentation. It's a graphic visual representation of information, again, could be information, could be data, or knowledge. The illustrations present complex information quickly and clearly, and the illustrations develop and communicate concepts using a single symbol or symbols to process information. So, interestingly enough, who can tell me what newspaper, and again, type in, what newspaper has an infographic on the front page every day? I got Tribune, okay. USA Today, that's what I was thinking of. So, yep, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, thanks folks. Yeah, this is really US News, yep. This is really the next wave. And we talk about, you know, and I use the phrase stickiness. We talk about people remembering your name in the workplace. We talk about people um, remembering information and remembering concepts. What I'm finding is that visualization is becoming more and more a large part of how people learn. And if you can provide good visuals with your data, not just graphs, not just numbers, but colors, pictures, people will remember that 
data much more likely. So let's talk about some different infographics. So here's here's a diagram or here's a uh, a slide on your most popular infographics. So you have kind of a you know one way of looking at it is you have the periodic table of uh, something. And I, I like this because you're making fun of infographics because one of the things that you have to worry about with infographics is where does the data come from? The data is been mined, the data has been analyzed. Where does the data come from? And that's always my question with infographics. So if you can become a, a purveyor of data and honest data, then what you can do is you can create good infographics that fit. So you, you've got your bar charts there, you've got your largest to smallest, you've got your water gas, um, a Venn diagram, and then you've got that bottom right corner there, which is just a classic, a crap load of a lot of the data put together in a big vertical image. Always be, it, it, it's making fun of it, but always be, you know, when you look at these infographics, you should ask your, yourself the question, where is the data coming from? Do I believe the data? Do I believe what it's about? You know, you still have to, what I call, use the sniff test on it to make sure that what you're looking at is, is reality. But if you can present the things in a very, very Cute informational way, and I use cute because I'm not really that cute. But you can, if you can do things in a cute informational way, you have a better chance of the information sticking. So I'm going to move to the next slide, and here's I love it, your infographic of an infographic. So this is, you know, what do we do? How do we understand an infographic? So we use infographics so you can understand the infographic. So again, all different tools that you can use to create an infographic. Oh, what is the sniff test? That is, I call it the sniff test. Does it smell correct? Jen, that was a good question starting. I use the sniff test. So as I look at data and I look at what they're trying to tell me with the story, I use the sniff test, which is, does it smell correct? Does that answer your question, Jen? Thank you. Yep. And again, if it doesn't, if logically it doesn't make sense to me, then I really start to question where the information has come from. So here you have a slide of the infographic on the infographic. And now we're going to get to some fun ones, though. Here's, here's the fun one that I found the other day. This is my favorite. I'm, a, I'm kind of a dog person. And so um, this is a, a very interesting, and, and if you really think about it, the creativity that goes into these is phenomenal. So what you have here is, and I have to move my slide here because I'm missing my lower section. Oh, I'm drawing on it. No. Okay, but the bottom, what they've done, just kind of give you a background here. What they've done is they have two different assets here. So this is actually a regression analysis. You have a Y axis and an X axis. But you have public popularity on the Y axis. And on the bottom you have basically a data score that um, created that was created by the, the, the maker of this of this infographic, and what you have is basically um, popular dogs versus their data score, and um, you have basically this, this basically predictive model of how your dog is. And the interesting thing is uh, you have intelligence. So dogs that are facing the left are dumb dogs. Dogs facing the right are considered intelligent dogs. And then you have your small, medium, and large size dogs, so it gives you an idea of the size of the dog. And then you've got your, your different groups. So for those of you AKC folks, you have your herding, your hound, your non-sporting, your sporting groups, your terrier, your toy groups. So a very, very interesting um, way of analyzing basically dogs and showing where your dog would, would, um, would show up on this infographic. One minute here, one. There we go. Okay. And I love that Ruth. Ruth picked it up. There is a cat on the chart, so there's. A, I saw that too. And the cat is in green. So what's interesting is the cat is considered a non-sporting animal. So that's great. Yep. So where are the pugs? I don't know where the pugs are. I've gone through this. A large cat didn't go. I haven't gone through this very well. But I just wanted to share. I have two Britneys. And the Brittany, Brittany is right there. So I get, I get pretty high 
pretty high points for my Gritty, and I'll say what, I've had a lot of dogs, and my Gritty is pretty smart, so I agree with the scoring on this one. Um, oh, both Gritty's are pretty smart. Um, so very, yeah, very interesting little, um, little illustration here. The takeaway from this, let, let me ask, I'm going to actually throw it out, out to the folks in the field. What, is, what do you think your takeaway from this is? I'm, I'm interested in knowing what people think about this. What is your takeaway from, let's say, this best in show infographic? What is your takeaway? No takeaways. Nobody has any takeaways. Too busy. Okay, there you go. How many data sets can listen to one infographic? There you go. Where's my dog? <laughs> Sometimes the figure's not better. There you go. Full times are loose, so we'll be careful. My own people. Both dogs are nice, though. My dog is dumb. There you go. I can see the other dog. We've got second. That's busy. I like love it. A lot of data represented in a fun way. That's, that's what I like. The creativity here is really phenomenal. Complex. I like that, too. Um, legends are vital. I agree with you. So, representative. Representative type of behavior, great. Type of dog, it's like, yes, great. These are all great answers. Yep. So one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to share regarding infographics is it, it takes a number of different groups to create infographics. Obviously, you probably had um, designers here that helped you design it. You've got creative minds that look at you know what size, left versus right facing dogs, what colors. There's a lot of things. Um, yeah, you shouldn't, I like that, you shouldn't include kid friendly dogs, yeah, um, kid friendly category. But there's a lot of things that went into creating this. So, generally speaking, when you're looking at infographics, you didn't create it on your own. You use a team of people to come up with this creativity. So, very, very important. So, I went over um, another interesting infographic. This is one of my favorites. This is um, basically, and we talk about, you know, how can you use other infographics for, for what you need to do. Imagine creating an infographic like this for, this could be a bartender's infographic on how to mix a drink, right? This could be an infographic that you would have at your, at your desk for something that you don't use very often. Uh, it could be IT related, it could be any one of many things that you can use in your, um, in your organization to help people understand how to log on to a computer, how to run a certain software package. Bottom line is infographics are, are phenomenal ways of representing a lot of different things. So this is mine on how to make a martini, which I like. Um, and then we have, this is a really interesting one. So this is 56 years of tornado track. So you want to know where tornado struck and what the magnitude of the tornado is. This is a very interesting way of looking at looking at it from a graphical representation. So you can tell, you know, if you're tremendously afraid of tornadoes, you can uh, decide where you want to live in the U.S. Um, for example, left brain data with right brain marketing, very good, yep. But this is a great tool for, for predictive analytics for Zurich, for example. So if we want to look at where, where and who we're insuring um, property-wise and what our chances of uh, <laughs> no sharp NATO representation might be. <laughs> Um, but this would be where where we would ensure what, what pricing we would get based on certain regions of the country based on catastrophic tornado events. So yes, we could use this from a predictive modeling perspective. So that's another different interesting infographic. And here's one. We didn't take a very specialized software package to do this. Yes, it does, but the interesting thing is when you go online and you look up infographics, there are a lot of free software packages to make your own infographics. So they're all over out there now. The key, in my mind, the key is, is your data accurate, number one? And then number two, how creative are you? And if you're creative, it's a great creative outlet for you. I'm not very creative, so I have a difficult time. I need to ask people how to be creative. Um, I'm an operational guy. I look at numbers. So, but here's an interesting one of historical gas prices. How many people remember back? Let me ask somebody a question on this infographic. What does this infographic say to you? 
Good infographic or bad infographic? Bad. Bad. Need inflation. I, I would agree. This doesn't. This doesn't necessarily. Tens will increase in 50 years. Sure. Color coding. I love that color. What does the color coding say to us here? What does purple mean? Right. All good questions. Yep. All good. Good. Good comments. To me, this is an interesting um, historical gas price, but it doesn't really say much to me. It doesn't speak to me. I believe the bars are telling me, uh, based on magnitude and size, um, how much it is, but this one doesn't, doesn't say a lot to me from an infographic. It's informative, but it doesn't say a lot to me. It just shows that the gas price is going up. And last but not least, questions from the field. Questions on big data? Any questions on balance scorecarding? Any questions from on uh, infographics? And by the way, have some fun with infographics. They can be really fun. Could you explain? Okay, so could you explain data fusion again? Okay, last but not least, data fusion. Data fusion is basically where we're taking big data. And we will send a slide, and I think uh, Cheryl will talk about that in a second. But um, data fusion is basically when you integrate big data, so you take data and you use knowledge to uh, integrate the two and basically create a higher form of modeling. So you use data, knowledge, which then gives you modeling. Where they use that in is basically sensor networks, they use it in robotics. So there's feedback loops in robotics. It's kind of an artificial intelligence. Um, data fusion is creating artificial intelligence through data and knowledge. Does that answer the question for? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. And um, do you find that there are diminishing returns in collecting large amounts of data? Um, yes. At some point, that's a really good question statistically. At some point, when you get a data set that's large enough, you can, you can stop analyzing more data because that data set already tells you what you need to know. So you don't need to go into the hundreds of thousands of data elements in order to get a, to get a precise answer. You would spend more money and time on mining it and processing it than if you went with a smaller amount of data. So how do you distinguish data analysis from big data analysis? Seems very similar. Big data analysis uses tools that are more IT specific for large volumes of data. And understand what you're doing is with large data sets, you are basically um, using advanced tools to call that data down to usable, um, really small data sets. Does that help you, Andrew? Okay, I'm being told we need to wrap it up. So with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Carol. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks all of you for joining us on our webinar today. We hope you found it to be very beneficial. A lot of good information out there. Um, the Leadership Learning Webinar Series uh, is made possible, as we said, by the Trustmark Foundation. Again, we would like to thank the Trustmark Foundation. Um, they have made it possible for us to bring this to you at no cost. We will be having uh, an upcoming webinar. The next one is scheduled for Wednesday, November 18th. The topic for that is meetings that won't make your coworkers go crazy. So you should be receiving uh, registration information about that soon from Natalie Carrado. Finally, we value your feedback. Uh, you will be receiving a link to, to a survey in a little while, as well as the link to this recorded webinar. Um, that email will be coming to you from Natalie Carrado. So with that, I'd like to thank you once again and end this session today. <laughs>